Now, to microsurgery, as Dr. Yasser has mentioned, next please, the microsurgery, as Dr. Yasser has mentioned, is about the uh, uh, exploration of the brachial plexus, and this is must be done during the first year of life, preferably the younger, the, the younger age, the better. Uh, the indications are which patient would benefit from such intervention. We have in broadly two, two, two main types. The upper plexus injuries with absence of recovery of active elbow flexion by three months of age. This is one indication. Or in the complete injury with surgery done at three to four months of age. And this is to have an easier anesthesia and surgery. Despite that, the fact that we know that such babies with complete injury would certainly have uh, surgery. Next, please. The position. Now we're talking microsurgery is, in general, in brief, after exploring of the plexus properly, definition of what, 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 where are the damaged part, excision of the damaged part, and then bridging with grafts from the sural nerve mostly the, the this defect plus using nerve transfer if this uh, this connection is not enough so i would concentrate on this presentation on the fact that such a surgery needs to be done carefully and for, for one to do careful surgery, one should be familiar with the landmarks. So we start by position. We put a sandbag under the ipsilateral scapula with the head turned to the other direction. Next, please. This uh, extends the, 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 the spine and uh, makes the, the field easier. The incision is a, the, that, that is commonly used is a classic L-shaped incision following the posterior border of the sternomastoid, then along the superior border of the clavicle. This allows the extension to be prolonged along the deltopectoral interval if exploration of the infraclavicular plexus is needed. Next, please. And then. And then. Under the skin, immediately, we find the platysma. And immediately under the platysma, we find the supraclavicular nerves. The supraclavicular nerves could be very, very fine. If possible, one can uh, preserve them. And if not, one should cut them a little high so as not to make a neuroma. Isolation and ligation of the external jugular vein is frequently needed as it will it, it, it comes into the way. And then going a bit down, we will go over the, uh, the supra, the, over the prevertebral fascia. We have the lymph nodes and among the lymph nodes, there is the transverse cervical and the suprascapular vessels. They should be identified ligated, and cut in order not to provoke any bleeding. And then one finds the omohyoid, uh, cut it in the tendinous part between the two heads. The omohyoid leads one very easily to suprasternal notch where the uh, suprascapular nerve is found. The lymph nodes and the fat in the posterior triangle are retracted laterally away from the posterior border of the sternomastoid to expose the prevertebral fascia that is covering the plexus. And then, next, retractors on the medial side should not go beyond the medial border of the scalenus anterior. Retraction should be gentle. And because beyond this line, there is the, the, the carotid sheath with all the important uh, contents. And then we start the, the condition by identification of the phrenic nerve on the anterior surface of the scalenus anterior between the muscle and the fascia, heading from above downwards, from lateral to medial. This is when this is done, one can trace the, the phrenic nerve 
to the level of the C5 root, which is located where the phrenic nerve lies on the lateral border of the scalenus anterior. When one finds C5, one goes a little bit down opposite the lower foramen, C6 and C7 under C5 under the corresponding foramen. Next. And then, exposure of the lower trunk and its roots necessitates clavicular osteotomy. Clavicular osteotomy is done carefully. And then the lower trunk is identified behind the clavicle next to the pulsations of the subclavian artery because the, the artery and the lower trunk, they resemble each other. And only the pulsations makes a difference. And one feels it to be sure that this is the nerve and then and to, this is the artery. And one finds immediately next to it the, the, the lower trunk. And then one can, exposure of the plexus distal to the neuroma starts by identification of the pulsation of the axillary artery. You always find the identification of the artery in order not to make mistakes by inadvertently cutting important vessels. Next, please. And then. By following the omohyoid to the suprascapular notch, locates the suprascapular nerve. And in order to finish the identification of uh, the important elements, one should retract the fat pad and the lymph nodes medially away from the anterolateral border of the trapezius at the level just above the, clavicle, the clavicular insertion. This helps in locating the spinal accessory nerve if one needs to do, and this is frequently done. If one follows these um, uh, uh, guidelines, one should finish the exposure without spending too much time. Then, next please, following the... Uh, there is no role here, next please, there is no role for neurolysis of the neuroma, uh, even if one mm, it, there is distal response to electric stimulation. If the indications were followed, meaning no recovery of active elbow flexion against gravity by the age of three months or incomplete uh, injuries, then excision of the neuroma and putting grafts or neurotization is needed. There is absolutely no role for neurolysis of the neuroma since all the, the papers uh, about this condition, they all presented poor, poor results after that. The neuroma is cut in the middle and then gradual resection is done in both directions until healthy nerve fascicles are found. And when the healthy nerve fascicles are found, one can now, can now make a map of what is available as uh, roots with extra foraminal rupture that one can use to graft the distal plexus. And if one needs to use neurotization or not. Next, please. Incomplete, if at exploration of complete lesion, the C8 and T1 root appear intact on exploration, while there are no clinical signs of recovery, especially with no response to intraoperative nerve electric stimulation. This means intraforaminal evulsion. In this condition, neurotization of the lower trunk with some other source should be done. One should not say that. Uh, one should not say that uh, this is looks okay. It would recover if it would have re would recovery would have already done. It has or one would see clinical picture before going to to surgery. Next, please. Now reconstruction of the plexus should start with sural nerve grafts from the available healthy roots from the available healthy roots, ruptured extra foramen. Restoration of shoulder abduction and external rotation, elbow flexion, elbow wrist and finger extension, wrist and finger flexion should be the aim. However, relative or complete absence of available healthy nerve roots might make reaching this aim difficult or sometimes impossible. 
So, next please. Other sources of actions in if such condition is available should be used. Next please. The spinal accessory is frequently joined to the suprascapular nerve. In C5-6 injuries, neurotization from the ulnar, the median, or the radial nerves to the motor branches of the biceps, brachialis, and deltoid is sometimes done. In C5-6-7 injuries, neurotization of the elbow flexion, flexors can still be done from the median and ulnar nerve. In complete injuries, neurotizing the lower trunk is a priority. This can be done when there are three or even two good healthy nerve roots with extra foramina rupture. With only one healthy nerve root available, the use of contralateral C7 becomes necessary. Nerve grafts are passed subcutaneously across the neck to connect it to the lower trunk. The sural nerve would not be enough for grafting all these de deficiencies. And so one can use the superficial radial nerve, the, the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm in order to use this or probably some other mm, mm, options as well. Next, please. What's the role of intercostal neurotization frequently used in the adults and in the adolescents sometimes in traumatic brachial plexus injuries? Intercostal neurotization in babies should not be used as the long-term effect of their use results in the formation of the growth of the affected ribs with great reduction of the space available for the lung in the affected hemithorax. And this is a serious uh, draw drawback that made most of the authors in this field decline to use the, interco the intercostal neurotization in such an age. Uh, with this, next please. Postoperatively, some form of immobilization of plaster splint are used to significantly reduce the head and neck movement of the baby, as well as those of the upper limb. This is kept for three weeks, following which physiotherapy is resumed. Thank you very much.